is Executive Director of the Energy and Environmental Assistance Office within the Energy Production Infrastructure Center at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Barry Gullett is uh, Director of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Utility Department. Rusty Roselle is Mecklenburg County's Water Quality Program Manager. And Amy Nisley is a member of the Environmental Studies faculty at Warren Wilson College. And the objective here for us, locals from the Asheville area, even though Amy grew up in Mars Hill, uh, is to learn about how Charlotte and other communities within the Catawba River watershed are addressing their water challenges. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce Regina Geyer who really put this panel together and she's got a demonstration and we're gonna kick this thing off. So welcome. Thank you so much, Jim, and thanks everybody for being here. I think we're gonna have a great time this Saturday. And I just really wanted to take a few minutes to start us off with kind of that wow concept to let you know we're not just here to speak with you, we're here to interact with you. So the first part is we think about our water and what it means to us, it's more than just the river flowing down the road. It's things that are vital to our health. It's vital to who we are and what we wanna do. So it's just so important that we're working within it. And as we work within it, it involves you. So I wanted to think today and get you think about the different ways you get your water and the things that you're doing. So I don't know if you, can everybody see the exhibit here? Um, so we have beautiful glass glasses. We have a nice pitcher that's glass with glasses. We have the basic plastic cup. We have the basic paper cup. And we have the bottled water in the bottles. And we have a nice tub of water with our dipper so that we can get what we need. And I'd like to ask a couple of the audience to say what kind of water you would like to have from our table today. So if, you're, if your name starts with a G, would you raise your hand? Any no G's? <laughs> First one. First one. E either, either one, anybody in the audience, name starts with a G? With an S. Oh, there's a G in the back. So what kind of water would you like today? Um, plastic cup, I guess. The plastic cup, all right, wonderful. How about somebody whose name starts with an S? What kind of water would you like? Oh, lots of S's. <laughs> what, what kind would you like? I want one of these little glasses. The little glasses? All right. The, this kind? The crystal? Yep. All right. I think we had another S or two over uh, here. Out of the dipper. Out of the dipper. Do I yes. <laughs> All right. And then the, behind you, what kind would you like? I'll take one of the little colored glasses. Okay. Wonderful. So does it matter how our water, what we put our water in? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. What, what matters about that? Yeah. Which one's healthier than the other, do you think? Glasses. You think the glass is healthier than the dipper? Well, yeah. Depends on whether she puts her mouth open. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have a nice dipper. But to the reality of it, when we have our rivers and we're using our river and our water, we're all taking it. We're all putting the dipper back in, whether our mouth got on or whatever. So the real reality is this is our water, and we're all using it, and we're all responsible for it. So it doesn't matter what it's in, but what it's really in is our watersheds, and our watersheds of how we take care of it. And sometimes I think this dipper in and out is maybe the great technology that we have that takes care of that water. So that when we take it out to put it in the beautiful glasses, <coughs> It's been treated by a utility company and treatment process that's made it purified for us. When we put it back in, after we've had a nice drink out of it, it goes to a treatment facility that helps take our waste and residue out of it too. So it does matter when it comes in. I'm glad nobody chose the bottled water. <laughs> you guys are a smart audience, what can I say? You know, the bottled water might think, make you think that it's really the best thing, you get got your own personalized uh, sanitation system, but the bottled water is not even regulated. It's not even regulated to the same that the treatment facilities do. And when you get through with it, you have this. And do we really need this? Are we that much more important that we need to make another pollution problem for the environment? I saw a lot of good head shaking. So you guys are an excellent audience. This really involves you, and it really does make a difference what our water goes in. But more importantly, I believe it makes a greater difference in what goes in our water. 
and what we choose as individuals to put into our water. And as we care about it and have great utilities to take care of it, and we put things into it, I want you to be aware of that. And I'm really appreciative of our panel today. I appreciate your audience participation to start us out because this is about you. And as our watershed, if you think about the things they're talking about today, realize that this great bucket, this great dipper, is the water that we all share. And it's a limited quantity, just like that bucket or the pitcher. It is a finite quality quantity, and we want to use it well. So I appreciate your coming to learn about it. I appreciate Jim and the Woman's Legacy to bring us together to talk about it today. So I bring you our panel today. Excuse me. I'm Regina Dyer, and as you mentioned, I am from UNC Charlotte. I work with the Energy and Environmental Assistance Office. And what the vision of that office is to facilitate, implement, and inspire. I really want to bring together the entities that have research or projects to do involving our university and involving our students for experiential learning for real problem solving on environmental and sustainability issues. Uh, I am an engineer and I've worked together in water quality as a water professional for over 15 years. And I'm excited to be here today to bring our great panel. The first part of our panel will be Rusty Rizal. As Jim mentioned, he is the manager of the Mecklenburg County Water Quality Program which is charged with protecting and restoring the quality and usability of the county service water resources. The water resources are abundant in Mecklenburg County, including over 190 miles of shoreline and portions of three of the 11 lakes that comprise, that comprise the Catawba River system and over 3,000 miles of streams in the Catawba and Yadkin River basins. Rusty has worked for Mecklenburg County for over 34 years in environmental protection including 30 years as a manager of the county's water quality program. Thanks for being here today, Rusty. Barry Gullett. Barry is the director of Charlotte Mecklenburg Utility Department. It's a regional water and sewer utility serving about a million people. So he's the one helping clean that dipper in and out of our water systems and great facilities in doing that. Since joining the utility in 1978, Barry has served as a civil engineer, assistant chief engineer, and interim water treatment superintendent interim wastewater treatment <coughs> superintendent, deputy director, and was appointed to the director position in 2010. He is a graduate of UNC Charlotte and a professional engineer. He serves as the chair of the Catawba Water Region <coughs> Water Management Group, as a member of the Board of Trustees for the North Carolina American Water Works Association, Water Environment Association, and a delegate to our Water Environment Federation. Thank you for being here today. And Amy Nicely is here. She is a specialist in environmental law as it relates to land use and natural resources. Dr. Nicely has a PhD in philosophy from the University of Colorado, a master's of environmental law and policy from Vermont Law School. She's currently a professor of environmental studies at Warren Wilson College here in the Asheville area. And her career in higher education has also included service as a department chair for Colby Sawyer College in New Hampshire and as a senior vice president at the Unity College in Maine. Dr. Nicely's teaching and research plans ethical, environmental, and the law, and with an emphasis on understanding when and how the perfect can become the enemy of the good. As a native of Western North Carolina, Amy's research is complemented by her practical experience. Over the past decade, she has co-managed a small organic farm with her husband and co-founded a mutual multi-farm all-organic CSA and managed a small farmer's <laughs> market. Thanks for being here. So our program today is a great panel. We're going to take turns at the podium with a <coughs> presentation, and then we want to engage you again at the end with our discussion and comments and questions. Does that sound fair? Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's get started. For those of us who live in the Catawba River Basin, it's probably our most important natural resource, whether we know it or not. Some of us know it, a lot of us probably don't, but my task here this afternoon is to talk to you about the Catawba River, to introduce it to you, to talk to you about how it's shaped our past, how it sustains us in the present, and how it's going to have a big influence on our future. And this is a, a shot of a portion of the Catawba River, we call it Mountain Island Lake, which is just west of Charlotte, before the dam was constructed there to create that lake, taken around 1910. And this, uh, the Catawba River system, there's Asheville, of course, and of course, Asheville is located in the French Broad, 
and the French Broad is part of the Mississippi, flows on the other side of the Continental Divide, flowing e east to the Mississippi or west to the Mississippi. And of course, the Catawba River is on the east side of that divide, and it flows into the Atlantic Ocean. And you, I've listed there the 17 river basins that are in North Carolina. In North Carolina, we are, we are blessed with abundant natural resources, water being one of our most precious. And we have 17 basins or, or watersheds. You understand the concept of a basin or a watershed. It's that area of land that drains to a common body of water. And that's what defines the boundary of that watershed. And the Catawba River in North Carolina, I've listed all 17 out here based on their size. So the largest river basin in, the, in North Carolina is the Cape Fear. The smallest is the Savannah. And you can see the Catawba right about in the middle. And in North Carolina, uh, it's about 6.24% of the state. And it covers about 3,000, a little over 3,200 square miles. So for all of us there that live in that watershed within the Catawba, we rely on it very, very heavily. And it starts actually up in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And this is not far from where it starts. It's called the Falls of the Catawba. And this is located about 20 miles east of here, up I-40 in Old Fort. That's where the Catawba River begins. And it begins in a series of waterfalls. There's an upper fall and a lower fall. This is the upper fall, uh, by far the prettier of the two, but it gets a very beautiful start out in life there in these waterfalls. And this kind of traces the course of the Catawba. And this is the backdrop or the background of this picture is taken from the top of that upper falls that I just showed you. So this is sort of looking out across the Catawba River Valley. And you can see it gets started off at about 2,300 feet above mean sea, mean sea level. And we end up down here where it flows into the Watery River at about 147 feet above mean sea level. And the first lake in the chain, y'all have probably been there, it's Lake James. It's not that very far from here. Uh, right there at Marion, followed by Lake, Lake Rodhias, which is near Morganton and Lake Hickory. Lookout Shoals, and then the largest lake in the system is Lake Norman, and then just below that is Mountain Island Lake, which I showed you earlier a picture of back in 1910, and it's bordered on the east and west by Charlotte and Gastonia. And then we have Lake Wiley, and we, then we, Lake Wiley flows down there uh, near Rock Hill. And then we have three smaller reservoirs, Fishing Creek, Great Falls, Rocky Creek, and then we have Lake Watery. And then from there, the Catawba River flows into the Watery River. So the Catawba River is a series of dams. There's 11 dams in all. The first dam was built around 1904. The last dam was built in 1963 and the dams were built by Duke Power, Duke Energy as we know it today. And the Catawba River in, ends down there near Camden, South Carolina, which you can see down here in the lower portion of the screen. The total river channel, channel miles, as you can see, it spans through both North and South Carolina in the two states. It's about 320 miles of river channel. In North Carolina, it's about 225 miles. The total miles of streams in North and South Carolina is about 5,000, and the total area is about 50,000 acres. There are 24 counties in the watershed or the basin that flows into the Catawba River, and those 24 counties cover about 6,000 square miles, and there are over 2 million people that live in the, in the basin or the watershed. And of course, the large, largest city is, of course, Charlotte, and wanted to give you sort of a larger view of the river system. This is the slide I just showed you earlier, except it ended right here at Lake Watery. This is the Catawba River. Lake Watery flows into the Watery River. The Watery River joins the Congaree, which is a combination of both the Broad and the Saluda rivers. The Congaree and the Watery joined together here in Lake Marion as part of the Santee Cooper River system. And then Cooper River flows down in here into Charleston Harbor. Santee flows in just north of there into the Atlantic Ocean. So that's, that is the Catawba River, uh, what it looks like, where it goes, and where it starts. 
and one thing for sure about the Catawba River, as well as with most river systems, they played or it played a tremendous role in shaping our past in all of the jurisdictions and all the county and land area that is around it. And this is probably no better illustrated than by a man named John Lawson. And John Lawson was an Englishman. He was a naturalist, very learned man. And he traveled up the Catawba River Basin, beginning in Charleston, and he paddled all the way up through, and he left the Catawba River and began traveling across land when he reached the Piedmont of the Carolinas, just north of Mecklenburg County. And he traveled all the way into the coast, into Bath, to Bath, North Carolina. And one of the things he said about the Catawba River during his travels was that it was delicious country. I don't use that word delicious too much talking about country, but uh, and he said, none that I ever saw exceeds it, and he said it was bounding in many and delightsome rivulets. He was, he was very impressed with the flora, the fauna, the, the wildlife that he encountered, as well as the Native Americans that he ran into. And the very first settlers in the Catawba River Basin were Native Americans, uh, Catawba Indian tribe, and they were a branch of a Siouan speaking tribes. And they once were considered a very powerful nation, and they were almost constantly at war uh, with the Cherokee, which is a predominant Native American tribe in, our, in North Carolina, in our portion of North Carolina. And they very much relied on the river for their very survival. They had a lot of fisheries or fish traps along the river. And I've not never seen them, but they say you can actually still see some of those fish traps down near Rock Hill, South Carolina. So they relied on the river for their food their drinking, their transportation. They farmed the rich bottomlands along the banks of the Catawba River. And just in Mecklenburg County alone, there were no less than 13 Catawba Indian villages along the banks. So they had a very, very substantial population in the Catawba River Basin when John Lawson came through here in 1700. Interesting the way they formed their villages. They, they always usually had some protective wall made out of sticks and then they had not teepees, but uh, more or less thatched huts or, that were uh, made out of sticks and leaves. And they would have a central council in the middle of their area there where they would hold most of their meetings. The other thing John Lawson noted in his diary was that thing about the delightsome rivulets. He was basically saying there was a lot of moving water, a lot of streams uh, here in the Catawba River Basin. And that in, caused people in England who read his diary, he took a very detailed account of his travels in the diary, and it was published when he got back to England. Folks that read it took note of those lights and rivulets, and a lot of the people that originally settled in the Catawba River Valley were of Scotch-Irish descent, and a lot of them were millers or millwrights. And they actually created various incentives for millers. This, the area of the Catawba was controlled by Lord Proprietors out of England appointed by King Charles. And these millers were given by those Lord Proprietors a lot of incentives to come and settle in the New World, including tax exemption, special protection under the law, freedom from military service, etc. And by, by 1800, there were, the Catawba River Basin was covered with meals. There were just meals, and in Mecklenburg County in particular, we had meals along most of the streams that had year-round flow. This is one of the last meals that operated in Mecklenburg <coughs> County, the picture on the left. It's Whitley Mill, which is along Long Creek, which drains right out of Charlotte, and it operated up until the early 1900s. And of course, it was operated or powered by water, and they would use a stone to grind your wheat into meal, and your flour, and your wheat into flour, and your corn into meal. And they also used it to turn sawmills for cutting timber into to lumber. And it was basically the only source of power that we had in our region when the Europeans first settled here in the 1700s. So the meals were, became sort of focal points where people would live and they would build villages up around the meals. A lot of times they would hold court and community meetings in the mill. And pretty soon the millers would become community leaders and you had communities to spring up around these mills. And so you can kind of get a picture of what a lot of the early development in the Catawba River system or the Catawba River watershed, uh, how it started. It started around these mills and around these surface water bodies. 
And of course, the Catawba River has very, very rich soil, uh, as a lot of the watersheds in the rivers and banks of the rivers do around here. And in the 1800s in particular, cotton was king around here, particularly in Mecklenburg County and down in Rock Hill. There was a lot of cotton grown. Uh, there was also a lot of corn that was grown. And what's really interesting when you kind of trace back history of transportation, a lot of the cotton was sent to market via the Catawba River. And this was before the railroad arrived in our area, which was in the 1830s. And prior to that, a lot of the goods were transported down to Charleston Harbor via flatboats. And they would load, if you were a plantation owner or a farmer, you would load your goods on the boat, usually about 60 feet wide, seven feet wide and 60 feet long, uh, just wide enough to stack three bales of cotton up on. And they would float it downstream along the Catawba River all the way down to Charleston Harbor where they would then load it on the big ships and we trade it almost exclusively with England. And of course, it's kind of hard to paddle upstream, so they would usually sail the boats for their lumber uh, by a horse and then you know, ride back here to their farm. And that was pretty typical from about 1820 to 1835. And several entrepreneurs down there around Lansford Canal in South Carolina actually built a series of locks to try to get around the rocky shoals there in the river. And they were very heavily used during that period of time in the early 1830s. Railroad showed up here in the late 1830s. Uh, the, the polling down the river sort of went by the wayside and the main source of getting goods to market back then was via the railroad. And of course the river, the Catawba River was a source of transportation if you were going downstream, but if north or if you were going south, but if you had to go east to west, it was an, an impediment to transportation because you had to cross the river. And probably today, I know I probably crossed 10 rivers getting here and I didn't think about any of them. I rode past them in the car, just lickety split. We don't hardly think about it anymore. But if you're in the 1800s, 1700s, and even the early 1900s, getting across a river was a big job. And the reason is there were very few bridges. And there were very few bridges on the Catawba River, even as late as 1911. This is a picture of Mecklenburg County. It's taken, this is a, a map of Mecklenburg County dating back to 1911. These are all the ferries that operated on the Catawba River in 1911. Now that's, what, 100 years ago, it's not that long. And there were no less than 13 ferries and two fords. And of course, a ferry is just a boat that pulls you across the river. And a ford is a shallow spot in the river. Usually it has a rocky bottom, so you won't get stuck in the mud and you can just pull your horse, your wagon across the river. And my family actually ran a, a, a ferry across the Catawba River starting in the late 1700s up until 1920. And it was called Rosell Ferry or Rosell's Ferry as a lot of folks like to call it. And there's a road in Charlotte called Rosell's Ferry Road. And so you would get off the ferry coming from Gaston County to the Mecklenburg County side. And there was a road called Old Plank Road that connected the ferry to Lincolnton. So if you were a businessman and you traded in Lincolnton and Charlotte, you would get up in the morning, you would ride your horse to the Rosell Ferry uh, along the Plank Road. You'd get on the ferry and you would cross the river and the family would put you up for the night, feed you breakfast, you'd get up in the morning, and by two o'clock you were in Charlotte. And that was a pretty common mode of travel for a lot of businessmen in that day. And this is what it costs. Uh, now, I don't understand. I did not the one that set these. For example, uh, every animal on foot for exhibitions was 25 cents. But if you had a, a loose horse or mule, it was only a nickel. I, I see, I don't understand it. But if you were, if you were a man uh, on foot, it was a nickel. And so what I did is I apply the typical inflation rate to that and that's what it translates to to today's dollars and I'm thinking about reopening the ferry someday so stop by if you're on your way to Charlotte and maybe uh, I'll give you a little ride across the river. Not bad prices really uh, but it wasn't that long of a trip either so now this picture is my great-grandfather standing on the ferry uh, it's taken around 1920 
And as you can see, it started out in the 1700s where they would use poles to push the ferry across the river. And then they got really sophisticated and they would put this winch on here with a cable and they would pull the ferry back and forth across the river. The reason why there weren't any bridges is because they were pitiful. This is a typical bridge that was built in the early 1800s. Actually, this is a picture of what was called Rosell's Ferry Bridge. And the, way, the way it goes is, is my, my great-great-great-grandfather ran the ferry on the ferry and he farmed both banks of the river. And in 1830, in the early 1850s, uh, a man came to him from the what's called the Western Plank Road Company out of Charlotte and he made a deal with my grandfather that if he would agree to shut down his ferry, he would build a bridge and he would allow my grandfather to use the bridge free to travel back and forth to his fields on both sides of the river. Because back then, nothing was free. If you had to ride a ferry, you had to pay. And if you had to cross on a bridge, you had to pay because it was all toll. Back, we didn't have an NCDOT. Government didn't build our bridges. It was all done by the private sector. My grandfather agreed to it. The Western Plank Road built a bridge, and everybody was happy until the Yankees showed up. And this is 1865 in the War of Northern Aggression, as we like to call it. And Sherman, of course, had invaded and captured Atlanta, and a detachment of his cavalry moved up through the Carolinas and some of them into Lincolnton. And my family that lived right along the banks of the Catawba River had heard that that cavalry was going to be coming to Charlotte. They were coming down the old plank road and they were planning to cross the river at the Roselle Ferry Bridge. So they realized real quick that Yankees had a bad reputation during the Civil War about tearing things up. So they knew they had to do something to try to stop them. So they got my great great grandfather, this is him, this is Lawson and his wife, and her name is Smiley, and she's not smiling so much in the picture. But Lawson was a deaf mute, as was his wife and they chose him to go out on that wooden bridge, pull up the planks, start it on the west bank over there so that when the Yankees got to the bridge they couldn't cross it, and it worked. He did that. They ticked, he was a deaf mute and they figured that if the Yankees started shooting at him he wouldn't hear them and that he wouldn't holler out and cause a commotion, so he'd be more inclined to get the work done and he was successful. And the Yankees did show up and they were not very happy and they fired on the house and uh, my grandfather got really mad and comes running out the front door with his shotgun and starts firing back because he had lost two sons during the Civil War. The Yankees got mad and they burned the bridge. And the bridge was gone, but the family reopened the ferry. And after the Civil War, uh, of course, Mecklenburg and all this part of the country suffered horribly during the war and after the war was even worse. Things were very, very, everybody was very poor. Money just did not exist. The economy was gone. And so there was no bridge. And that was really hard on the community. And, and we can't connect to the fact that, and if you live on one side of a river and there's no bridge or no good way to get across it, you're, you're cut off from everybody on the other side. You're cut off economically. You're cut off socially. And it was a big hardship for the area and there was a big to-do made about rebuilding this bridge and it didn't happen until 1910 and the point I wanted to make about the bridge and I said they were ugly early bridges were made out of wood and that's why there weren't that many around because a good rain event would wash them out uh, and so early bridges were few and far between for that reason they were very expensive to build uh, and this was a steel structure Built in 1916, spanned across the Catawba River where the Roselle Ferry was. Then came a flood in 1916, the Great Catawba River Flood, where we had two hurricanes to collide in the, in the mountains up here in the Catawba River Basin, and it washed all the bridges out, including the bridge there at the Roselle Ferry. Wasn't rebuilt until 1923, and during that seven year period, the family reopened the ferry. Uh, and that was the last that it operated. Now the river was also a focal point for early commerce. A lot of manufacturing occurred along the river in the 1800s, particularly cotton mills. Uh, mills like this one, the Mountain Island Mill in Mount Holly where they would make sheeting, yarn, wool for blankets, and they even made some cloth. And this mill covered over 1,100 acres, had a village along its bank, right beside of it, and was a huge center of commerce along the Catawba River. 
the first dams on the Catawba River were built to sustain that commerce. This is, we don't think about this either, but the first dam, the dams were built along the Catawba River for hydroelectric power generation. That was the source of early electricity. And the first dams were built not to provide power to the residents, but to provide power for manufacturing. And the hydro station here was called the Catawba Hydro Station. It was built in 1904, not by Duke Power, but actually by Dr. Gil Wiley. Uh, he lived not far from, in, down there in South Carolina, far from where this dam was built. And he wanted to build it to help spur manufacturing in his hometown. He did, and it was in the late 1910s before Duke Power bought it from him, and this was the first dam built on the Catawba River. And the, the original dam covered, or created about a 600 acre lake that was called Catawba Lake. It was rebuilt in 1925. This is what it looks like today. When it was rebuilt, made bigger and wider, now it covers about 13,000 acres from that 1925 reconstruction. The last dam was Cowan's Ford Dam that was built to form Lake Norman, which is the largest lake in the system. This is a picture of the completed dam. It flooded in 1963, covers 32,000 acres. <coughs> A little bit about the past, I want to talk a little bit about the present. It, it, the Catawba River definitely sustains us in the present. There's no question about that. Uh, the best example of that is in the, with the water that it provides us. There are over 60 permitted water withdrawals on the Catawba River, and that totals about 641.5 million gallons every day pulled from the Catawba River for municipal drinking water, industrial, and agricultural uses. To put it in perspective, that's enough water to fill Panther Stadium two and a half times every day. That's how much water. And without that water, just think about what the Catawba River Basin would look like. There would be no city of Charlotte uh, because the city of Charlotte gets its drinking water out of the Catawba River. This is actually a picture, an aerial of Charlotte Mecklenburg Utilities Departments, Barrett, the department that Barry directs, uh, their drinking water intake on Mountain Island Lake, where they're withdrawing about 80 million gallons of water a day on average from that lake to supply the drinking water to the residents of Charlotte and the towns of Mecklenburg. And the situation throughout the watershed predominantly for the Catawba River is the only other supply of water we really have drinking water is groundwater from whales but the yield from the groundwater in Charlotte and throughout the Catawba River Basin is not enough to provide all the water that we need for our growing population. So we have to rely on the Catawba River. Recreation's big as well. 10 million people visit the Catawba River lakes, one of those Catawba River lakes every year. It's gonna increase considerably in the time to come. 50% of Duke Power's ability to generate electricity relies on those lakes. And the other thing about the Catawba River Basin is there are over 60,000 acres of state and local parks. There is a national wilderness in Linville Gorge and a national park in the Congaree National Park. So uh, natural areas abound and it's very important for that resource as well. But the threat is, is pretty simple and it's very, very real. Uh, we have experienced a lot of population growth in the Catawba River Basin. In Charlotte alone, since 1973, which is just 40 years, we've more than doubled in population. And that has been repeated in communities all up and down the Catawba River. There is a much greater demand for water today than there's ever been before. But our water resources are threatened. They're threatened on two points. Uh, so you've got really an increased demand for water coming headlong into an increased threat. And this is the Catawba River watershed. All the waters that are in red, the lines in red, indicate water that is polluted. And basically, the more people you have living in, the air, in any area, the more water pollution you have, the more degraded and impaired streams you have, and the less of water you have, of clean water you have available for water supplies. They monitor, the state of North Carolina monitors about 360 miles of, of streams and rivers in the Catawba River, and it is estimated that about 48% of those 
stream or lake miles, river miles are polluted or impaired. And the primary source of that impairment is urbanization, stormwater runoff, pollutants from impervious area. And it's pretty easy to see it when you lay the urban areas over top this map. That's where the urban areas are, that's where the stream impairment is. The other threat, and let's not forget the drought of 2007, 2008, and I know Barry's gonna to touch a little bit about on this. Uh, North Carolina suffered from this worst drought in recorded history. And we had portions of the lake where there was always water, where there was no water anymore. And this, of course, many of the lakes in our region suffered from this. When you have water that's more polluted and you have water where there's less of it, particularly during droughts, you've got more people depending on it, then you have, you have a real problem. You have a, a something that really needs some work and some attention. And definitely the Catawba River shaped our past. Uh, it's sustained us in the present and it's gonna influence our future, particularly as our populations continue to increase. And no doubt we've gotta commit ourselves to its protection if we really wanna sustain some of these communities that we've developed along its banks. And that's it, unless there are any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, got shocked. I, uh, I always like to see Rusty's presentations. I always enjoy the, the pictures and Rusty's passion for the Catawba River Basin and his personal, uh, personal connection to the history of it with his family and um, it's always, I always learn something from listening to Rusty's presentation. The, that's um, one thing. The other, the bad news is, is that my presentation probably won't be nearly as interesting. I don't have all those cool pictures and everything, but let me see if I can get my presentation to come up here and get it started. Okay. Um, I want to skip over some stuff. The, uh, the Catawba River, as Rusty said, really has an important history to, the, to North Carolina and South Carolina. And it has played a huge role in how we've grown and developed. It's really the source of commerce, the source of the economic growth, the vitality, the quality of life, all the things that have made North and South Carolina such a great place to do business and to live and to play and to raise families. All of that really traces back to what Rusty talked about with the Catawba River and how it started. The bad news is, is we have a problem. The problem is, is that it is very popular and it has sustained a lot of growth. And we've become accustomed to that. And if we continue along the path that we have started for the last hundred years, we're gonna reach the capacity of the Catawba River to support any additional growth and any additional economic development. And we're gonna do that a lot sooner than a lot of people realize. We could reach that point in this generation could see that happen. It's projected that it could happen as, as early as the middle of this century. That would be tragic because what that means is, is that there would be no new houses, there would be no new businesses, no new hotels, no new hospitals, no new schools, because there wouldn't be any water to serve them. We couldn't be out recruiting employment. We couldn't be out in, uh, recruiting companies to move here and move their headquarters here that provide, that provide the support to our, uh, to our arts community, to, to our sports franchises, to, that provide the jobs that we all have and enjoy for, and depend on. So reaching that point that quickly is just not an acceptable answer. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is some work that is underway to help us avoid reaching that point so quickly. So let me start out by saying that uh, when I was introduced, most of my introduction was about my job as director of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Utility Department. That's my day job, okay? My other job is, is that I'm the, um, I, I have the pleasure and the honor of being the chair of a nonprofit corporation called the Catawba Water E Water Management Group. And this is, a, is a, um, a group that was formed in 2007. It came out of adversity, but it has been a, a very, very successful group. 
There are 19 member organizations of the Catawba Water, Water, Water Management Group, and we'll show you this in a minute, that, um, that, that support it and who work together. But I want to acknowledge that we have some, some sponsors for this, uh, this project that I'm going to talk about that I need to acknowledge. One is the Duke Energy Foundation. Now, this is not the Duke Energy Company that generates power. This is their, their uh, philanthropical foundation. Uh, also, the North Carolina Department of Environment and Natural Resources and the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources have helped support the project that we're going to talk about. Uh, we did a, a, a project a couple years ago that led to this point that was co-sponsored by the Water Research Foundation, which is a, uh, a nonprofit company in, uh, based out of Denver, Colorado, that provides support to support water resources in the water industry. And our consultant team that did this master plan that I'm going to talk about uh, consisted of HDR engineers and McKim and Creed engineers. So um, Rusty showed you the map, but this is a little different, different twist to the same information. And so here you can see the, the basin and all these little stars and squares and dots and triangles and stuff are various water plants and water intakes and wastewater plants. And you can see there are a lot of them and they're scattered all over. And while they don't all depend directly on the Catawba, they're heavily influenced by the Catawba or they're tributaries to the Catawba that are, con are, are creating some of the solutions and creating some of the problems that we face. So, so that's uh, what we have. Rusty talked about the river in terms of the dams. Very heavily backed up river, very heavily dammed. And this, what this shows is, is that there really are only two free flowing sections of the Catawba River. One is below Lake James, and the other is below Lake, uh, Lake Wiley. But from this is a, a, a graphic a schematic, basically, that shows that the lake is essentially backed up from one dam to the toe of the one above it, except for those two sections. So the Catawba Water Water Management Group, as I said, is a, is a nonprofit. It's a 501 c 3 It's formed in 2007. Uh, the members pay dues into it. We have an annual budget that's about $550,000 a year. And it was formed to identify, fund, and manage projects that would make the Catawba River, Catawba Watery River, more useful and protect the environment. We knew that there were problems. We knew that there were things that needed to be worked on, that needed to be studied. But they were the kinds of things that no one municipality, no one water utility, no power company was going to undertake on their own. They were the kinds of things that had to be done together. And so we were able to bring this group together uh, and form this, this corporation to, uh, to meet that need. It's been very successful. Here is a list of the, the members. To qualify to, or to be eligible for membership, you had to have an intake on, the, on one of those 11 reservoirs or on the main stem of the Catawba that's influenced by those reservoirs that had a capacity of at least 1 million gallons per day. And so there are exactly 18 um, organizations that fit that description, and they are all dues-paying members of this group and Duke Energy. The bylaws are written so that Duke Energy is a critical part of this, and they also pay dues into the, um, into the organization. So we've done a lot of projects. You can go to our website and see a list of our projects, and you can see the reports and all that. But I'm going to focus really today on the most ambitious project that we've undertaken and maybe one of the most ambitious projects that anybody's undertaken in the Catawba River Basin in its history. For the first time, we've attempted to put together a basin-wide water supply master plan that looks out more than 50 years into the future. We're trying to figure out how to, how to get more use out of the Catawba. And the use that I'm talking about is how do we make it serve the people? How do we make it provide that commerce? How do we make it provide drinking water? How do we maintain it as a recreational source? As an, aesthetics pleasing, as, an, as an aesthetically pleasing place to live, the tax base that, that those recreational and aesthetic issues bring to the region. How do we sustain that beyond the point that we talked about and that we learned earlier could happen at the, end, uh, at the middle of this century? 
So we started this in three phases. The first phase was really to develop the scope and figure out what would a project like this look like and what would it cost. The good news was is that it was determined that it, it, you could very easily do those things. The bad news was is that it was very expensive and it cost way more than our water management group's budget could afford. So the main part of phase one, we tasked our consultant team to go find the money to do this with. In other words, we didn't scale the project back. We said, what does it cost? What's it going to cost to do this project and to do it right? We came up with that number, and it was about $1.2 million. So we said, okay, let's go find the money. So as a nonprofit, we were able to approach uh, uh, foundations and, and other potential uh, funding sources, funding partners, and so we were successful in, in putting together the money to make this happen. So then we... we uh, we started the, the plan development itself, and I'm proud to say that it's complete. And it will, the plan itself will be released on Friday, this coming, uh, this coming Friday. Uh, there will be a news conference on, on uh, the shores of Lake Wiley, and we will uh, release this master plan. It will be that day, it will appear on the website for the Catawba Watery Water Management Group, which is Catawba Watery WMG no spaces or underscores or anything like that, .org. And um, I will warn you in advance that the, there are three sections to it. There's an executive summary, there's the body of the report, and there are a set of a, an extensive set of appendices. If you choose to download the whole thing, you better have a lot of paper in your printer because it's well over a thousand pages, okay? The, um, a lot of that is appendices, but the main body is, is, is something between two and three hundred pages. So there's a lot of information there, and it's not just regurgitated information that they went and asked somebody and wrote it down. This project and this plan has a lot of depth to it. It has a lot of substance. It's been tested. It's been vetted. There's been a public process uh, around it. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of work and support that's gone into developing this, and it's a plan that, that I am really proud to have been a part of. But there's another phase, and the, the third phase of this is the implementation. So the water management group is taking this plan out to all of those cities that are in the basin, and we're going to be doing presentations to their boards, uh, to their commissions, to their councils, and asking them to support this plan and to enact it to, so that we can make the Catawba River continue to be useful for us. Uh, then the other part of phase three is starting to look at water quality. The water management group was formed around the issue of water quantity, but we believe that water quantity and water quality are linked, and so we believe we need to ex extend the master plan to cover water quality as well. So our stakeholders in this process um, are listed here. We tried to pick stakeholders that represented broader constituencies and charge them to communicate and give us feedback and be the liaison, I keep slapping that thing around, to, uh, to, to help get a really broader perspective on, on all of the issues that we're facing. So, uh, so you can see the list here, and they were all very active. We really appreciate all of their support and hard work on this. They met uh, at least a half a dozen times. There were some other meetings that they took place uh, with them, but there were six official meetings, and. Uh, they, those have wrapped up now. A lot of elements in the master plan, you can see them here, but the real focus of the master plan was, can we make the river last longer? And how do we do that? And we were willing to look at that from all angles. In other words, it wasn't just a matter of, can you get more out of it? There was, a, there was also this, the demand side. In other words, how can we use what we have more efficiently and more effectively? So we looked at it all the way around. We looked at at how did we calculate the safe yield? Was our model right? We compared it to models and safe yield calculations for rivers, not just across North Carolina or the United States, but the whole world. We, we brought in, uh, as part of a, that earlier um, research project with the Water Research Foundation, we brought in a team of folks who, who uh, had done work in Australia, who had done work in Asia, who had done work in Europe, we were comparing how we calculated the yield of the Catawba River to the, to the, um, to the rivers in those, those other countries, to the Danube, to the, to the Mekong, 
uh, to the, the rivers in the major rivers in uh, in Australia, which I can't think of the name of right now, something darling. But the uh, but anyway, what we found is is that the way we were doing it was was at least equal to the sophistication, the complexity, the considerations that were being done across the world. So that made us feel pretty comfortable with what we had. But a major part of that was, and a major unknown was climate change. And what's, what is the effect of climate change going to be on the availability of our water down, down into the future? Are we going to have more? Are we going to have less? Or is there going to be no impact? And so we did a lot of work on that. And what we determined was that, um, what we determined was is that the main impact that climate change is likely to have is because of increased temperature. There is a huge evaporation volume of water from the Catawba chain because of all the surface area of those 11 reservoirs. Anyone want to hazard a guess as to how much water might evaporate from the Catawba River chain on a hot July day? A million gallons? I'll tell you it's measured in million gallons per day. I'll tell you there are three digits in the number and it's north of 300. 300 million gallons per day just evaporates into thin air as they say. You know, so that water is gone. So when you, you remember the number Rusty had up there, it was 600 and something million gallons. Now that number, that's not a net withdrawal, that's a gross withdrawal. In other words, people take out 600, but a lot of it gets put back. But there's 300 million of evaporation that just goes, it's just gone. You know, so, so that, the temperature increase is projected to increase that number somewhere between 17 and 26 percent over the next 50 years. That's a lot more water. So that is another hit, another reduction to the volume of water that we can count on having to use for all those various purposes that we, that we do. One of the important management tools that we have on the Catawba is something called the low inflow protocol. And this is, what do we do when, when we're in that drought? When it looks like the picture that Rusty showed with the tire sunk in the mud. That's an ugly picture, Rusty. You need to get a better picture than that. But that was an ugly situation. It's an ugly time when we're in a drought like that. And so, so this low inflow protocol prescribes actions that the power company will take and that the water utilities will take and that industries will take when we're in those various stages of drought. And so that has been a very important component. It is enforceable. It's part of Duke Energy's relicensing agreement. It will be incorporated into their Federal Energy Regulatory Commission license when it gets issued. So that is a, uh, that's a document that we, that we have that uh, is serving us very well. Unfortunately, we had the opportunity to test it. It was developed in 2006. 2007, what did we have? We had the worst drought that we, any of us have ever seen in this area. And we voluntarily implemented the low inflow protocol and it worked. It worked very well, but we learned a lot from it. And so, so going through that has allowed us to tweak it some and that's going to help us um, get past there. But, this chart, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but this just shows what the trigger points are and the things that are measured uh, as part of the low inflow protocol. Um, the things that, that, what it does is essentially sets up a progressive schedule of, of actions that get more and more serious as the drought becomes more and more serious based on those triggers and those, those indicators that we've established. And so um, there are restrictions on water use, there are changes in the, uh, the amount of water that has to be released from the dams. That is really the main use of water, is it gets released through the dams. It generates electricity when it's doing that, but it also maintains the flows required to support the environment downstream. And that's where most of the water from the lakes goes. Most of the water doesn't go to the water utilities, to the, even to the industries and the people that are using it most of the water is used to generate electricity and passes downstream and once it goes through the dam it's it's as they say that's water under the bridge it's gone so so there's uh, that's an important piece of it there's a, a hugely important communication component to the LIP to the low inflow protocol and it's communication between the the water suppliers the, the the municipalities the local governments 
and their customers, our customers, but it's also communication with each other and it's coordination because this is not a Hickory problem or a Morganton problem or a Charlotte problem or a Rock Hill problem. This is all of our problem and, and, and none of us can solve it individually. We have to work together to be effective at solving this. So that communication aspect is hugely important. Um, I talked about this, I'm not going to go into it, but this is the, the tailored collaboration research project that was done. It's on our website. It's very interesting reading. Uh, you can go, go find that on our website. The, uh, but the factors that, that influence how much water we can get out of the river, uh, first of all, there's how much does it rain, so how much water is coming in. Uh, then you've got the operation of the reservoirs, the dams, like I was talking about, how much water you have to let out and, and, and why you're letting it out. Uh, there's the evaporation component. There's also a sedimentation piece. As, the, as time progresses, all of these lakes by nature would fill back up with silt. And so when, they, when the silt comes into the lakes, it reduces the storage volume. Well, which area is silt in first? The shallow areas or the deep areas? It's the shallow areas. That's the areas where the silt hits first. So those are the ones that fill up first. Well, Lake Norman at the dam is, what is it, Rusty? 125, 130 feet deep at the dam. How much of that water do you think is useful? How much of that water do you think we can tap into and use? Any ideas? How deep do you think we can go down out of that 125 feet? How about 10? Does that sound reasonable? That, but that's reality. 10 feet, that top 10 feet is what's usable. So, so that's an important thing to look at. Um, I talked about the climate change impacts. Uh, we've, done, we've, we've really looked hard at the projections for water usage and withdrawals. We look at it in terms of net withdrawals. In other words, we take a lot out, but we put a lot back. Um, we did a lot of modeling. All this stuff is on our website. We tried to bookend these scenarios. So what's the best we can expect? What's the worst we can expect? And then what do we think looks is reality? What do we think that looks like? And that's what we tried to plan for. It would be real easy, and I can tell you already, because it's already, we're already starting to see it, that there are, some, there are some folks that are going to throw rocks at this master plan. And they're throwing rocks at it because they're looking at it from a very narrowly focused perspective. I respect that, and it's a very much needed um, situation because we need to understand the extremes. But the water management group's intent here was to create a practical plan that had real steps in it that could be implemented. If you look at it in the extreme and in a narrow focus, you'll never achieve that. And so, so that was an important aspect of this. But as I said, you can expect to see, uh, to see some, some critics of this water supply master plan because there will be folks who say that it doesn't go far enough, that it's too broad, and that it's not, uh, it doesn't meet that very narrow and somewhat extreme focus that a lot of, uh, a, a lot of groups have. Um, this is a complicated looking chart, but basically this is three scenarios, top, bottom, and the middle here, and it's looking at some of those bookends, and it's looking at when do the various reservoirs fail. And our definition of failure in this system is if any one of them fails, the whole thing has failed because they're all so interconnected and so inter interrelated. And so you can see in the baseline case, up at the top there, you can see that the, the red indicates failure. So you can see that, that Lake Wiley, under the baseline scenario, is predicted to fail the middle of this century. And so you can see then, under the slow population growth, that pushes out quite a ways. But under the high population growth, it could happen as soon as, as 15 years from now. You know, so those were some of the, the bookends that we were working with. Um, I'm going to skip that. I'm about out of time. We looked at 27 individual planning scenarios and then we tried to combine those into how do we put those together to have something that's doable, something that doesn't have a huge impact on the economy, a huge negative impact on the economy, something that doesn't put people out of work, something that lets people still enjoy the lakes and still enjoy all the benefits that they provide, but still pushes that time frame when we hit the capacity as far out as we could. So let me skip to some of the solutions. Okay, pardon? It is scary. Um, all right, so 
we've, we've tried to break this plan down. It's a 50-year plan, and so we've tried to break it down by decade. What do we need to be doing? So a lot of the plan really focuses on water use efficiency. We're not calling it conservation. It's more than conservation. It's how do we efficiently use the water all around, from power generation to household use to industrial use to irrigation use. How do we improve that? There's a series of steps. There's very, um, very um, specific goals that are set for water users in this plan. And so we, we have, but we have to start now because they're really going to be difficult to, to do and they can't be done in, in a short period of time. It's going to be a change in the way we live. It's going to be a change in the way we do business. And so we've got to start now working on that. Uh, there's some physical things we can do. I talked about having access to that top 10 feet. We can, we can lower some intakes. There's, there are critics of that because they say, well, that just lets you pull the lakes down farther. Well, that's true, it does. But the only time you have to pull the lakes down farther is in that extreme drought. That extreme drought is what we're working around. There's always the possibility that we're going to have a worse drought than any of us have ever seen before. That's a very real possibility. And so there's some, some kind of contingency plans built in this, in this uh, master plan for that. But um, so that, that is a, a piece of it. The, um, uh, we, we looked at the, the, when the power company, when Duke operates their lakes, they have target elevations for all the lakes. They have to balance having room to not have one of those floods that washes away the bridges like Rusty showed us versus having enough water in the lakes to meet all the needs. And so one of the things that we looked at was raising the operating level in the summer, the target operating level, uh, by six inches. And so that makes more water available in the case you do have a drought. And that low inflow protocol, we learned that the faster we respond to those triggers, it, it has a huge benefit just a matter of a few days during a drought of cutting back that flow release from the dam makes a huge difference. And so, so those things are planned and are being uh, built into the LIP. So I'm almost out of time. Like I said, the final report is going to be issued on Friday, May the 9th. There are 25 results and recommendations in the report, and it works. If we implement that plan across the basin, it will extend our water supply beyond the middle of this century. So that's, uh, that's a good thing. That's my presentation. Two weeks later, 
And I'm wondering if you want to offer us any advice up here in uh, how we might do something differently. That's the first question. <laughs> Okay, I would not put this under the category of advice. <laughs> but I will say that um, when, I, when I started talking about the water management group, I said that it, was, that it was born out of adversity, and it was. And the group was created in, um, was, was really the, the, the seed that became the corporation was, began probably in 2004 somewhere about 2004, 2005. And it came out of the Duke, Duke Energy FERC relicensing process. But during that time period, does anybody know what else was going on in the water world in North Carolina in the mid-2000s, other than the droughts? Something called interbasin transfer. Right. And um, the folks who were the, um, the charter members, the, the continuing members of the water management group, were um, were neck deep in interbasin transfer embattlements. There were lawsuits. There were challenges to permits. There was all kind of adversity going on between the cities that formed the water management group at the same time that we were forming the water management group. I never figured that out. <laughs> I never figured out how we were able to pull that off, but we did. And what has come out of that is that we work together. We don't always do things exactly alike, and we recognize that. And we try really hard to avoid a one-size-fits-all solution that we are, are somehow uh, trying to prescribe that the basin should do. And when you look at the Water Supply Master Plan, you see goals, and you see suggested actions, and you see toolboxes of different ways that things could be achieved. But there's not a prescription in there that says, that says that Morganton has to do this, or Marion has to do this, or Charlotte has to do this. But what we do set out are goals. Like there's a water use efficiency goal that all of us share that is, is a half a percent per year per capita water use reduction. That's significant. And we've all bought into that. Now, we've got a lot of work to do to see that it really happens. It won't happen unless we do something. This is, I, I'm going to have to uh, tell on a little bit about our utility, Charlotte Mecklenburg Utility Department. I fuss a lot because we have this bad habit of making a grand plan and crossing our fingers and hope it happens. And that's one of my pet peeves is, is with this and with everything else we do, we can't plan that way. We can't use the cross the fingers method to get things done. We've got to have a, a strategy and have actionable items. And so that's what I believe the, the master plan is, will deliver. That's been our emphasis from the very beginning. So I wouldn't say that all is lost because of the okay. adversity <laughs> that's going on. Uh, I would look at the opportunities that might come out of it. Uh, We've gone through some, some of those kinds of growing pains with our utility. Charlotte Mecklenburg Utility Department, for those of you who don't know, I didn't say much about it, let me put in a plug. Uh, we were created in 1972, and it was created with a, by a merger of the city of Charlotte's water and sewer system with Mecklenburg County's water and sewer system. Uh -huh. And that we were merged as a city department, the city of Charlotte. And then in the 80s, we, um, there are six other towns in Mecklenburg County other than Charlotte. So in the mid 80s, we brought those other six towns, reached interlocal agreements with them so that they became part of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Utility Department or CMUD as we're, we're known. And, and they, they gave up their water and sewer systems. That was really hard, really, really hard for them to do because a lot of municipalities and local governments uh, see water and sewer systems as a method of control they can control their growth, they can control um, you know, industry, they can control a lot of things, that, or, or at least they believe they can. Uh, sometimes that works better than others. But that was really painful and it was really hard, but it's been a huge success. What it has resulted in is, is that we all pay the same rates. It used to be that the rates outside of, Mecklenburg, outside of the city of Charlotte were double. The water and sewer rates were double what they were inside the city. Now they're all the same. 
the policies about when water lines get extended, where they get extended, those policies are the same throughout our service area. So we, we don't really look at it as to whether it's in the city or whether it's in Huntersville or whether it's in Matthews or whether it's in an unincorporated. It doesn't matter to us as a utility. We treat them all the same. So that's been part of our evolution. We just, uh, just signed an agreement with Union County, the county to our south, who has five wastewater treatment plants. We're gonna operate those wastewater treatment plants for Union County. This is, uh, this is something that doesn't happen very often, where one local government is essentially serving as a contractor to another local government, but they have five wastewater treatment plants and we'll be the contract operator. They'll pay us a fee to operate their wastewater treatment plants for them. We start June the 1st. Both boards have already approved the, the agreement. So, so those regional factors like that, they can be painful. They take a long time. They have to have a driver. They have to have a trigger. But, but I wouldn't say that all that discussion, it's not all bad. Thank you. That's a long answer to a short question. Well, but sorry. It's, a, it's a loaded question. <laughs> right, and we want to open for you some questions. So I'll, I'll bring the microphone around and we'll ask some questions. Are you ready for them? Thank you for your start. I just wanted to add, what about the, the airport? And, I mean, that, that may be the case it didn't work out or isn't working out as well. Well, the airport is very similar to the water issue here in Ash, Asheville. Um, and it's at the same, basically the same place. It's, it's in court. And um, we really aren't sure what the drivers were for that. And so who knows, but, right. But we're still, still working on that. So we'll see what comes out of that one too. Let's bring it all together. What is the status of the interbasin transfer issue nowadays? Um, and you might want to make sure my understands what that is. <clears throat> okay. Interbasin transfer is when you take water out of one river basin and don't put it back or put it back in a different river basin. So um, if you remember Rusty's basin map up there, there were some counties, Mecklenburg being one of them, that were split between two river basins. In the, in the case of, of Mecklenburg County, we're split between the Catawba and um, it's, it's actually the Rocky River, but it's part of the Yadkin, it's a tributary of the Yadkin. But the, and, and we get all of the water that is used in Mecklenburg County out of the Catawba River. So we have customers in the Yadkin River Basin who are using water from the Catawba. That's an interbasin transfer if we don't return that water back. When you use water out of a fire hydrant in the Yadkin River side, whether it's to fight a fire or to wash a street or whatever, that's interbasin transfer. If you have a water main break or a water main leak on the Yadkin River side, that's an interbasin transfer. If you have a wastewater plant that discharges water that came from Catawba but gets treated and discharged on the Yadkin side, that's an interbasin transfer. So, so it's, a, it's an important part of making utilities work. The concern is, does it do environmental damage to either basin, to either the basin that's giving it up or the basin that's, that's getting it? And so that was one of the, that was the contentiousness around the Catawba because uh, Concord and Kannapolis um, are in the Yadkin River Basin. They really don't have uh, a, a very good large source of, of water supply that's close to them other than Lake Norman. Lake Norman is the closest large water body to them even though it's in a different drainage basin. And so they applied to the state to withdraw, uh, I think they asked for like 26 million gallons per day of interbasin transfer. And that's what set off the storm because their timing was such that they made that request in the middle of a drought. And, and so everybody was really sensitive and, and, it, and for good reasons about uh, the potential impacts of that. And then South Carolina weighed in on the issue and there was actually a Supreme Court uh, lawsuit. South Carolina sued North Carolina. South Carolina alleged that North Carolina's water regulations weren't adequate to protect the, uh, the state of South Carolina and to be sure that they got their fair share, their equitable apportionment of the water from the, from the Catawba River. And so the Supreme Court agreed to hear that. Uh, there were verbal arguments made before the Supreme Court. I had the opportunity to go sit in on that. That was amazing. That was really a great experience to be that close to, to the Supreme Court. It, I was in awe. But, but anyway, um, so, so where we stand now is, is that 
the issue with Concord and Kannapolis got resolved because they scaled way back on their request and they agreed to take water from the Yadkin before they started taking water from the Catawba. They're doing that. And uh, at this point, they, at one point, they were purchasing water from, from us, from Charlotte Mecklenburg Utility Department, because they had built a reservoir and it wasn't full yet and they were having trouble, so they bought water from us. They haven't bought any significant amount of water from us in a number of years. So their, their real interbasin transfer today is not very much, if any. And so they are, uh, but, but in the future, they will probably exercise their, their authorization for, for interbasin transfer. In the meantime, the North Carolina General Assembly has made several runs at changing interbasin transfer law. And they, uh, there was one attempt that, uh, that didn't go anywhere, but there was another attempt that did. And so it's become much more difficult to get a permit. It's reg the interbasin transfers are regulated and you have to have a certificate authorizing you to make that interbasin transfer. Those certificates are much more difficult to get today than they were in the past. They require a lot more in the terms of analysis. They require a lot more in terms of notification, public involvement, um, demonstration of need. There are a lot of, of different factors today that, that, make, um, that make getting approval or increasing an interbasin transfer, transfer certificate very, very difficult. Those are all excellent questions, and, and, and I don't want you to take my answer to this wrong. Um, I, I don't mean for it to sound flip, but the answer to that, as far as who decides whether there's going to be growth or not, and where it happens, and what, what kind of growth, are, are the people that live in the community. And because it all boils down to, to land use planning, it boils down to providing facilities and providing uh, services. And, and those decisions are made by, by the communities, by the, by the planning boards, by the elected officials. Um, I mean, that's, that's where that decision is being made. As a, as a utility uh, provider, as a water and sewer service provider, yeah, we're part of that, that city, but, but the water and sewer part doesn't do the land use planning. Our charge is really to take those land use plans that are developed by the community. And this is particularly important as you become more regional because our utility isn't dealing with one planning board in one community, we're dealing with seven planning boards and seven planning <coughs> communities, seven town planners, so to speak. And so we have to, we have to adapt and, and be prepared to provide the service that those decision makers, those policy makers are, are prescribing um, you know, over the long term. And that's where this water supply master plan is so important is, is that it, it rolls up those projections because Marion's and Morganton's and Rock Hills and Camden, South Carolina, they all have different approaches to planning and growth. And so the, the water supply master plan has to try to accommodate all of those different, different philosophies and different projections about what growth is going to do in their area because even though Camden, South Carolina might be doing one thing in their planning and growth, that has an impact on Marion and Morganton and Charlotte because these lakes are so interconnected. And so that's why, that's why you really need to look at it in, in, a, in a broad regional context. Well, I was interested when a gentleman whose concern is specifically water quality has a uh, predisposition about growth or how much is okay. <coughs> Well, um, certainly growth causes issues at, with water quality and water quantity, but, well, just like Barry said, it's really up to the people in the community to decide uh, if, if that community grows or if it doesn't grow. And I think if past history is indicate any indication of the future, our communities are going to continue to grow, uh, and that's inevitable. And I think Charlotte's going to continue to grow. Uh, it is going to continue to grow a lot, uh, and certainly the communities south of us down in South Carolina have, have ambitions toward the growth as well. So 
I mean, the demands are going to be there, and they're not going to get any less. And I don't think there's anything that anybody can do about it except to plan for it, which I'm, I'm very, I have not heard about all that Barry's group has done, and I'm very impressed. I think it's very, very good and certainly needed to happen. And can I just speak to that very briefly? Just so you know, in the international community of folks looking at sustainability problems and environmental problems, there are conferences on degrowth, on sustainable shrinkage, on steady state, on the kind of planning that's involved, the kind of community communication that's involved. So there are other kinds of thinking out there um, that are kind of aspirational in a way or just offer another angle on this. And I think water is such a great um, case study in that when it comes to growth pressures, you know, if the water reaches its limit, that's serious. You've hit a real wall there. So we, of course we have to plan for growth because that has been the, the case. It would be crazy not to. However, it's also useful to try to envision what would it be like to have a good life you know, for a lot of people that doesn't assume a lot of growth or doesn't assume ever higher you know rates of productivity or you know the other things that we've got going on and there are a lot of people who are thinking about that and designing communities around that so just know that that's out there too right and i think as we look at that and we look at how the value of our water is and as we talked about in the beginning uh, you know we're all drinking out of the same container of water the same balance of water that we have and i know barry you had a statement for us about the value and what's truly in our water as i talked about what you put your water in but it's also what's in our water. And I'll let Barry kind of give us our summarizing statement, and I know there's more questions, but we want to officially say, you know, for those of you that came for the meeting that ends at 315, we don't want to have over a post on you. And if you do have some questions, our panel doesn't mind staying here a few more minutes. We'd like to keep engaging with you. But we do want to give you this and let you know it's, it's officially over. Oh, well, well, please stay. Saying it's okay for some of you to walk out. But <laughs> make sure you fill out your speaker evaluation or the evaluation form for this session. And, uh, uh, please join us next week for our closing event in the series on the PDA. Is it next week? Next, next, next Saturday. Next Saturday. Gary Springston is the water supply manager for PDA. So. Okay, and it's a meaningful series. Right now, we just want to thank Jesus. <laughs>a question that gets asked a lot about people's drinking water and and you can if you had one of these bottles you can pick it up and it, and it tries to answer this question to some extent but it answers it in a different way and the question that gets asked is so what's in the water what's in the water and, and if you look at labels and and every time I've heard people answer this question they start talking about chlorine and fluoride and all, all those things but I have a different answer for what's in the water and my answer about what's in the water is that what's in this water, maybe not this bottled water, but what's in this water, I'm not biased, but what's in, what's in this water is health. And what's in this water is, is vitality for each of us individually. I mean, how long could we get by without clean drinking water? And how long could our communities survive without water? What's in there is safety. How's your fire department going to work if they open the fire hydrant and no water comes out? And what's in the water is sanitation and cleanliness. You know, what would, we, what would the world be like if we couldn't take a bath with clean water, if we couldn't take a shower, if we couldn't flush our toilets? You know, things would be a lot different. And so there are a lot of things in the water. And, and so the other thing that I see in the water is value. And um, a lot of people, unfortunately, struggle to pay their water bills, and, and that's really difficult. It's really hard to deal with. Water is not one of those things that you can live without, and so there are, there are moral and ethical issues and, and business issues around how much water costs and who pays for it, but, um, but think about what your water costs. Do you know what your water costs? And I, I can't, or, there's no one here from Charlotte, I bet, except Rescue and I and Regina. But in Charlotte, I, people ask me all the time because I don't think people understand how much their water costs. And so we've tried to break it down into terms they understand. Our water bills are terribly confusing. I hate them, 
but they're really hard to change. So, but we're working on that. But anyway, in Charlotte, does, does anyone know what a gallon of water costs? Anytime you want it, in your house, ready to drink, tested and certified as safe and meeting all the standards. Anyone have, want to guess what that gallon of water costs? Got a dollar. Any other options? Five cents. Five cents. <laughs> All right. So far, everybody's way too high. Yeah. Three tenths of one penny. Three tenths of one penny for that gallon of water delivered. You get up at two o'clock in the morning. You don't have to think about it. Turn the faucet on. It's coming. It's there. No problem. Anytime. Christmas day, Christmas morning, your birthday, whatever the day is, it's there. All right. So, so that's the water. So, so then there's the wastewater side of it. And so, so to take that water after you do anything with it you want to, you put it in the pipe and, and it goes away. So we collect it, we take it back to the treatment plant and we clean it up. And when we put it back into the creek, Rusty can attest to this, it's cleaner than when we took it out. Okay, it's cleaner than when we took it out. And we do that for seven tenths of a penny. So for a penny a gallon, you've got the water delivered, you use it, we'll take it back, clean it up, return it to the environment. So to put that in a little different terms, if you take an eight minute shower, which is supposed to be kind of the standard from what I understand, it's not the standard in my house, but <laughs> that's what I read. So if you take an eight minute shower, it costs you 20 cents. What value we have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As the water, I've been with Charlotte Mecklenburg Utility Department since 1978, and I have never heard that I can remember anyway. My memory's not as good as it used to be, but I, I don't remember ever hearing anyone talk about going outside the Catawba River for drinking water supply, except, except possibly the Yadkin because of that interbasin transfer and having an alternate source so that we don't have to do the interbasin transfer. But I've never heard any other source we've explored we've talked about groundwater potential rusty addressed that there's just not enough you can't serve a city the size of charlotte with the geology and the groundwater scenario that exists in the piedmont um, you know from from groundwater but we do have the space yeah most m most basins do have some interbasin transfer either in or out because there, when people created cities and counties and water systems, they didn't follow the boundaries of the basins. They followed other, <coughs> other uh, boundaries that were formed for other reasons. And so it, from a practical sense, interbasin transfers serve a need. Um, there's differences of opinion as to what the impacts of those are, but, but they do serve a need. I, I have a question. Uh, I'm very encouraged about the potential um, for improved rainwater management, um, and particularly at the residential scale, because I don't think that the uh, <coughs> municipal, uh, industrial uh, scale work that can be done in terms of infiltration can be adequate without engaging the community. So uh, I do know that uh, Charlotte has an incentive program for people to that put in um, uh, programs to help infiltrate the water. And I want to know if um, if your plan includes any aspects for improved rainwater management, and also what uh, how how is the incentive program. Um, affecting the work that's going on in Mecklenburg County. That's yours, Rusty. 
<laughs> we do have through, and mainly it's through our soil and water conservation program in Mecklenburg County, we do have uh, support and assistance for installing what we call rain gardens or systems that take rainwater and allow it to infiltrate into the soil instead of run off on hard surfaces like it would in an urban area. And that I would like to say that that is um, going well, but we really don't have that much participation. I think Charlotte uh, in Mecklenburg County as a whole is really challenged to try to infiltrate water because of the very urban nature of our environment there. And so it is very, very difficult. We have a town of Huntersville, which is in the, in the north, just north of Charlotte, which is the second largest jurisdiction in Mecklenburg County. They actually have a requirement that a portion of the rainwater from sites or stormwater from sites be infiltrated, filter, filtered through the ground. Uh, and they have struggled. Uh, they've had that now for 12 years and they've struggled uh, with trying to keep it because it's been so challenging. But I think that you know, the EPA and, and at the state and federal level, there's a lot of emphasis on what they call green infrastructure, uh, filtering the water into the soil instead of letting it run off uh, into creeks and rivers and creating all that pollution that we talked about earlier. Uh, there's a big push towards that. However, I think it's, a lot of the urban centers around the country really struggle with it because how do you do that in an urban environment? It's extremely challenging. You have to focus. Right. Thank you. And would you answer about what the rainwater is part of your plan? Yeah, very good. It comes into play in the water use efficiency targets, and there are a lot of ways to, to to improve water use efficiency. Um, outdoor use of water is oftentimes one of the main targets for reducing water usage. And as a utility, we provide incentives for people to, who have in-ground irrigation systems to use something called smart controllers, which, which consider soil moisture and rainfall and even weather forecasts and determining whether the sprinklers come on at night or not. We do incentivize people to use those, but, but Rainwater, use of rainwater, uh, use of reclaimed wastewater, treated wastewater effluent, uh, all of those um, come into play in terms of being able to improve water use efficiency. I talked about the, water, the master plan not prescribing solutions, but setting goals and giving toolboxes, and all those things that, that you and Rusty have, have talked about are in that toolbox. Mm -hmm. In other words, more efficient use of, of rainwater, harvesting rainwater, uh, reclaimed water reuse, uh, encouraging different types of landscaping, uh, looking at, at how water is used in industrial cooling processes, can we use some other source instead of drinking water for that. Those, those are some of the components in the toolbox that we're trying to identify and flesh out and give to the, the, the cities and the water systems and the counties uh, all through the Catawba River Basin as tools that they can use the ones that fit and that work in their situation with their customers and what's acceptable to their community values to make this thing work. I have a question about Asheville. Uh, we've lived in the city here over 50 years and we came uh, and we were just so happy with all the water. We liked that. And the city had the water and the county didn't have uh, you know, they had to pay more for it. So this may be a political question. I understand sharing water was with this previous last Saturday uh, lecture was very well explained by this girl from Colorado, where they don't have a lot of water. So this may just be a political question. So I would like you to tell me what happened because um, we have a reservoir and I found out from the Colorado girl that they don't like reservoir so well for gathering water. But we've had a reservoir we were still paying for, you know, about half of those 50 years or more than that 
you know, because of, of the depression, and it was paid off. And so they said, well, you people in the county, you don't have taxes as much as we do in the city. So we don't think, you know, that it's fair. I don't think it's fair that they just took the water, you know, from us, and there's no, there's no, uh, I don't politically understand why they wouldn't even pay for some of the water that we've been ta paying taxes on, higher taxes than theirs. They just took it. Uh, first of all, let me say that I know a, a little bit about the Asheville water situation, but not nearly enough to talk about it in a public forum. <laughs> And, and so, but what I do know is, I know your water resources director, he's a man named Steve Schof, and Steve would have been here today, except that he is, uh, he's, he serves on uh, a board of trustees for uh, one of the professional associations here, and he is in a meeting with those folks today. But he was invited, and, and I'm sure he would have been here had he not had that earlier commitment, and he could probably answer that question. But I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I just don't know enough about the, Asheville situation to talk with with any degree of, of certainty and understanding about the background and about what's going on. I will add though that in again um, I'm not I don't want to sound like I'm saying that Charlotte Mecklenburg is the model that everybody ought to follow but that's the one that I'm the most familiar with so I can I can tell you what what we do and I'm not saying you should do it or you shouldn't do it but in in our utility we're an enterprise fund, and I suspect that, that your water department may be the same. And in, in that case, uh, we don't receive any tax money. So the tax pay issue is really sort of moot when it comes to, to our system. We operate completely off of the water and sewer bills, the revenue that we, that we generate from the sale of services. And so, so that's particularly important if you're a regional utility and you have uh, rate payers who are taxpayers in different and multiple jurisdictions. And so, so you, you, you lose that whole issue of tax fund equity when you become an, uh, an enterprise department and are, you know, take the, the tax piece off the table. I can speak to it really briefly. Um, in that depression era that you were describing, there were the county uh, developed a lot of pipe and line and infrastructure for water, and then um, those various districts, there were several that were setting up shop, they um, all went insolvent. And so the city took them on, but part of the thinking at the time, and then it became part of state law, was that the city would be restricted from charging those outside the city limits higher rates, because after all, those various districts had been building the infrastructure. So at the time in 1930, whenever, it had logic. Um, there was this sort of shift of infrastructure oversight, but only because you just had one solvent entity, which happened to be the city. But as was mentioned earlier before, it's typical for a city to charge higher rates to those outside of its district, outside of its bounds, if it's providing them water, because the theory is it takes more money to get it to them. However, Asheville does not, cannot do that. It has to charge the same rate. And so from the city of Asheville's point of view, this has been um, very restrictive on them and has pushed the city into having to forcibly annex units around in order to sort of maintain uh, an operable arrangement for the infrastructure. So it does give back, and part of the city's concern too is that Buncombe County doesn't have good systemic land use planning throughout the county, so it's a growth management thing too. So there's this, it's complicated, and I don't understand it very well either, <laughs> but there's that history, the inability to charge the differential rate, using forced annexation in an effort to kind of managed growth and feeling kind of pinioned and then our legislators you know here in this area have made the case that but we've got a we've got a set of users here it is the county and it is Henderson and it is the city and so at the moment I have sort of played hardball by you know forcing the city into this regional situation we'll see 
what Judge Leaning thinks on May 23rd when the arguments start to roll out. Well, to some of that, you know, that we, we've known about that for 50 years or more. Yeah. 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 But I still don't know that Yeah, it, it does come back as rain, but who knows where? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Probably not where it came South from. South Carolina. <laughs> yeah, or out over the Atlantic Ocean somewhere. <laughs> Let me take a, a shot at that. I'll try not, I could talk till tomorrow this time on that subject, but I'll try not to do that. I'll try to keep it. Oh, okay, is this not working? Does it work? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. I, so I'll try to answer that and I'll try to do it briefly. I could easily talk about this till tomorrow this time. In 1995, going back a few years, in 1995, privatization was a really big thing. It was the topic amongst the water industry, and there were global operating companies who were going around and making a pitch to various municipalities, small and large, to privatize their water system. There were two models for that. One is, is that in some cases cities needed cash. They needed money. They were, having, they were really struggling. And they were selling their water system or their sewer system or both to a private company. And then the private company comes in and operates it and sells the service back to the customers. What that amounts to is, is, is refinancing your water system and your users are paying for it twice. So we analyzed that and decided that was not something that we thought we ought to subject our citizens to having to do. The second model was is contract operations where a private company would come in and contractually operate a water plant or a wastewater plant or even a whole water system for a fee. And Charlotte Mecklenburg embraced that concept. And what we decided was is that we should be looking for who could, do, who could provide the best service at the lowest price. That was the test. And so we put, in, in Charlotte, there are three drinking water treatment plants and there are five wastewater treatment plants. We put a drinking water plant and a wastewater plant on the blocks. We said, okay, we're going to put this out for bid and we're going to award it to the best proposal, which basically meant the lowest price proposal. But we allowed city staff to compete. And we, we actually set up sort of a, of a contract group. In fact, we called them con ops, contract operations group, within our department. 
And we went out and we put together our own proposal. I led the team in 1995 that did this. We put together our, our own proposal and competed with those, I think there were seven, global, literally global companies, with French, um, yeah, British. Nestle, there's a great video on YouTube by the CEO of Nestle saying that war is no longer, it's not a right, it's a product, and, and that Nestle's after that product. Yeah, well the bottom line for that competition that we went through is, is we won. We submitted, we submitted a proposal that was evaluated, there was, a, there was an independent evaluation team that evaluated all the proposals, they had fixed criteria that they were using that applied to all of them, and we won on the basis of cost and of the quality of the proposal and the, the, the approach and the technique that we were going to do. We went through that process, it was a five-year contract, we actually entered into a contract with the city. We had a subgroup of our utility that was contracting with the city. We were very successful. We rebid at the end of five years. We rebid it. We won again. We went another five years and we rebid it again. And by that point, there weren't any other bidders. <laughs> except so, you're not trying to make a profit, the other companies are. Exactly. We, we have no shareholders except our customers. Anything that we make in the water, in the sale of water and sewer service, gets put back into the water and sewer system. So there, it's, not even a, it's not even like a, a Duke Energy where you have, you have dividends to be paid out. There, there aren't any. Steve does a great job. I really appreciate all the